I think it was the year 1937, I had re-enlisted in the Navy after my minority cruise. And uh, there was a war going on out in uh, the Far East, or not the Far East, out in the Orient. And uh, in those days, you know, there was no television and everybody didn't have a radio sitting right next to them where they got the news all the time. And if you didn't read it in newspapers, you just didn't know what was going on. So it was almost like a secret about this war. But anyway, the war was going on and they put me on the USS Henderson and, and sent me uh, out there. Well, uh, the Henderson could only go to the, the mouth of the uh, Wangpu River, which flowed into the Yangtze River, and uh, then there was a little uh, minesweeper came alongside, and all the uh, materials for the uh, Fifth Marines and for the the, uh, the the other Navy ship, which was the I think it was a Chester, was in, up there, up the river, and. Uh, Anything that the U.S. government needed was being loaded onto this little this little ship down here. It was, was tied up alongside the, the Henderson. So they also the deck uh, had ordered me up on the on the quarter deck with all my gear. And finally says, "All right, Barbary." He says. Uh, it's your turn. Go down that. Uh, uh, it, it was uh, not a ladder. It was it was a, a tarp rope over the side. So I lowered my uh, a sea bag over the side onto the the deck of this little ship, which turned out to be a minesweeper. And then I climbed down. Shortly after I got aboard, the uh, uh, little ship I was on uh, let go of the lines from the. Henderson and pulled away and started up the Wangpu River. Then I learned that the ship was a USS Finch. It was a World War I minesweeper and now it was called the Number Nine. They used to call it, uh, who's that coming down the stream? The Number Nine is underway. Anyway, had a big Number Nine on the bow. Then a tough-looking red-headed guy comes over to me. He had second-class bosun stripes on his arms, and he says, All right, Barbary, get your goddamn stuff bomb below and get the hell up here. We've got work to do. So we had to restore all this stuff going up the river and, and put it in the right position so we could uh, unload it when we got into Shanghai. Well, I didn't know where the heck we was. I didn't know about this war or anything else. And as we're going up the, the river, I see it was on the port side was the, uh, the Japs, and on the starboard side were the Chinese. And uh, they were firing at each other. There were regular artillery engagement going to, uh, across the, the river to each other. And, and the captain of the uh, Finch would sound his whistle and they stopped firing until the Finch went past them. We had, of course, the American flag flying and everything. So they'd stop firing long enough for us to get past them. And as soon as we got past, they'd start firing again. And then we started seeing bodies floating down the river. And we saw the, the damage uh, done to uh, places uh, on the beach where buildings had been blown up, you know, holes through smokestacks and stuff like that, and uh, it was pretty exciting. And, uh, and, oh, and in fact, the, the bosun had given me uh, a, uh, a helmet. It was an old war, uh, World War I helmet to wear. He says, you keep that on until I tell you to take it off. And of course, all, all the crew had the helmets on until we got way up the river past this fighting stuff. Finally, we, we arrived in uh, Shanghai, and first we went in it to a dock to un unload this, uh, uh, all this stuff we just uh, picked up from the Henderson. And uh, when we unload our cargo, 
we went back down to what they call the Putung uh, coal docks, and that's where the uh, Finch tied up. And just uh, down below from the, where we tied up, there was a, a boom of sunken ships across the uh, Wangpu River. And the Chinese had taken these ships and sunk them right in that stream of the river to keep the Japs from going up the river. Well, meanwhile, the Japs were all the way around Shanghai, and once they, they completed uh, the encirclement of Shanghai, then they'd move on up the river. And, the, and that the boom, a sunken ship, was the last holdout for the Chinese army. So this is my in introduction to Shanghai. Meanwhile, when it got dark, which was shortly after we, we tied up, the whole sky was all red. The whole city of, of Putung was burning, which is a, a Chinese city. Uh, Shanghai was divided into um, a French concession, an English concession, and American concessions, and they were they were all right. They they had uh, occasional bombs hit here and there, but uh, there wasn't any uh, actual fighting or damage inside the uh, foreign concessions of Shanghai, just in the Chinese concession, which was, as I remember, Putung. And it was a Putung coal docks we were tied up to. So uh, uh, that was my, my, my first day there. Then uh, I learned that, that, that the job of the, of the Finch it was the only American Navy ship that was going up and down the river. In fact, uh, probably the only only ship that was going up and down the river, and and so every time the Henderson or some other transport, anything that the was needed by the Fifth Marines, which were on duty in Shanghai, or the uh, or the uh, consular service, or the uh, the Chester, it was up to the uh, Finch to go down the river, pick it up, and bring it back again. And each time we went through this whole series of, uh, of shooting on both sides of the river. And we were quite a uh, well-known sight to, to both the Chinese and Japanese armies, which were literally engaged in this uh, uh, war action. So uh, anyway, uh, when, when, when we weren't actually on a, on a trip up and down the river, we'd be tied up to the Putung uh, coal uh, docks. And uh, of course, as I, I learned about the story about what was going on in Shanghai, and, and we didn't get any liberty. Uh, we, we couldn't go ashore uh, at that time. And uh, the Chinese, or the Japanese, had just about made it all the way around around the, uh, uh, the city of Shanghai. The one place they had to get was, was, was the river, and they had to get through that boom of uh, sunken ships. Well, meanwhile, uh, the captain made me coxswain of the, the ship's motor launch because I had been a, a, a coxswain of a motor whaleboat uh, when I was on the USS Chicago. And that meant I had the experience to uh, to run a boat like this uh, motor launch, and uh, that made me happy because if there's anything I loved in the Navy, it was when I was a coxswain of my own boat, and uh, so I made uh, uh, trips to the uh, USS Ch Chester, which was the flagships, sometimes to uh, to one of the, f the foreign uh, uh, the English cruisers or wherever that the captain might want to go, and uh, uh, so uh, the Japs started streaming up the, uh, on the other, on the opposite side of the river from where we are, and they were firing across the river at Putung, which we were sitting right on the, between them and the city itself, so Many of their shells would go over the head of us, and some of them even short. And uh, there was machine gun bullets with from 50 calibers and, and uh, big caliber guns, probably 
one pounders uh, sailing across us all the time. But the ship was struck by uh, by uh, 50 caliber machine guns. Uh, the whole side of the ship was, uh, and we had strict orders to stay away from the port side of the ship when when these fire uh, sessions were in progress. But one day, one of the guys heard that uh, noise of that machine gun bullets right on against the side of the ship, and he uh, opened the door of the mess room to see what was going in, and he got struck by two bullets, and one one other guy got hit. So. Uh, we had two casualties from Japanese uh, fire that day, and uh, so of course I, I had to take them uh, uh, from the ship to the uh, uh, Chester uh, for uh, medical care because all we had was a hospital equipment on our ship, and uh, then come back and, and, and tie up. Well, meanwhile, the, the Jap gunboats started coming down the ship. Now the gunboats. We're like, uh, we're like. Uh, remember those? Uh, what was that kind of ship that the president? Uh, PT. Uh, PT boats. They were like the PT boats, but they weren't as fancy as the PT boats. But they had the 50 caliber gun mounts, and uh, and the bigger guns mounted on their bows, and so they came came down, and they started to, uh, a, a fight with the Chinese that were on this some of, of uh, sunken ships. And, and uh, the fighting was getting real tough at that time. So, oh, I just remembered this. At that, be, before we, before I left the States, I got a little camera. It was a, a, a fancy a Kodak. They had a, a box Kodak camera. Have you ever seen those box Kodak cameras? You, you just look through them and you take a picture to no adjustment or no nothing. Well, this was a fancy one. It was a box camera, but it looked it looked looks like a real camera. It was a little fancier. Cost about five bucks more than a box camera, I think. Anyway, I had that little camera, and I had taken a few pictures with it. Of course, I didn't get much chance because when we were on the water, we, we always uh, had things to do, and they, you know, I, you bet that red-headed bosun never let me fool around with my camera as long as there's something to work to do. So anyway. From this, um, the, the, the Japs started tearing up this uh, boom of sunken ships, and uh, the uh, river, the, the, the current of the river was flowing towards us, and one of the, the, the wrecks broke loose, and there was a bunch of Japanese soldiers, and I think there was about six or seven, and they went right up against the stern of our ship, and they jumped off the stern. And on the stern of the minesweeper, it's, it's got a big uh, a stern because we, 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 uh, we uh, uh, tow things like targets and uh, 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 tow for mines and, and stuff like that. So we've got this big taffrail on the back, and these Japs jumped up on his, on his taffrail, and they're all standing there with, with uh, guns, with, with uh, bayonets on them. And they stood up in the taffrail with their bayonets down at us. And the American flag is flying into their face, and so the, the bosun made or somebody yell. Uh, 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 order we had the only one, only time I ever heard it was repel borders. So when you hear that, you run and grab anything you can—a knife, a gun, or whatever. Well, they, the uh, the gunner's mate has to go down and open up the uh, his, his locker. In order to get the guns out, we had uh, Springfield rifles and uh, and a couple of uh, 30 caliber machine guns stowed there, but they they weren't in the locker key until the gunner's mate got them out. So everybody would grab uh, Marlin spikes, uh, uh, knives, whatever. I carried a knife on my on my uh, belt all the time in those days. Uh, you know, a regular about a four inch blade knife and so I ran and grabbed my camera to take pictures of these Japs. So I took pictures of these Japs with their bayonets from the taff rail of an American ship with an American flag flying down in the face of one of them who was trying to push it away. So our captain came down. He was a lieutenant commander. He was, he was over rank for, for being the captain of a minesweeper. But he came calmly down 
and walk down and hear all the sailors were standing there with their with their marlin spikes and their their knives or whatever they had and the gunner's mate was uh, dragging up the the uh, ammunition and the and the rifles and the captain says relax men stand back stand back stand back and so of course we obeyed our orders and one of the uh, a Japs, one of the private Japs, could speak English and he became the interpreter between the captain of the Finch and the uh, lieutenant uh, uh, of these, that was in charge of these Japanese troops. And he uh, finally uh, got together and the captain asked him to please leave the ship so they jumped off the uh, the stern of the uh, finch onto the dock and they ran back towards the, the, the boom so that's the length. But I had these pictures and I, God these are wonderful pictures. Well, uh, from that day the, the, the Japs broke through the barrier and they, and they surrounded Shanghai and it was under Japanese control from that, from that day on. Well, then they moved us from the Putung docks because now we were in Japanese territory. And they moved us out on what they called Battleship Row, which was right in the center of the Wangpu River. The, the U.S. Chester was uh, moored and a, a, a big uh, English heavy cruiser and a, a German cruiser and, and, and different foreign warships were all moored along what we called Battleship Row, although there was no battleships. The biggest ship was, uh, was a cruiser's. So we moved out there too, and then we had to use my motor launch for everything. Well, after after the uh, Japanese took control of Shanghai, we were we were out of the battle zone, you might say. So we were allowed shore leave again. So this is the first time we got to go ashore. Well, of course, my motor launch uh, took the. Uh, the crew of the Finch ashore and I had to pick him up again. But um, meanwhile, uh, some one of the crew took my films ashore and got them developed. And when they, when they came back, I had these beautiful pictures of these Japanese with the, with the bayonets back there and the, and the flag flying in their face. So the, uh, you know, everybody, you know, I'd pass them all around the ship, everybody talking about him. So the captain sent for me, and uh, he said, I hear you had some pictures of the Japs. I said, yes, sir. He says, I'd like to see them. So I went down and got them for him. He says, well, Barbara, he says, I want to send these over to the uh, senior officer of float on the, uh, on the Chester. So I gave them to him, and uh, that's the last I ever saw them. When I asked for them back, <coughs> I, he's, I just got the answer that the that the uh, uh, chief. How you see him? Uh, I've been on the Navy so long I can't see him. Man. Anyway, the, the, the captain of the Chester was a senior officer. Oh, senior officer present afloat. <coughs> anyway, I never got my pictures back, and that was the end of that. But when you're when you're a seaman first class in the Navy, you don't, uh, there's not much you can do about it. Did you save but your negatives? I don't remember. I think the negatives were with the pictures, come think about it, because I never saw any of them. No. I never thought about the negatives. I think they were with, with the pictures, you know, Could just in the package. Right. Well, I mean, I didn't know the captain was going to take them away from me. And it's probably some national security thing. So anyway, then we got to go ashore in Shanghai, which Shanghai was the, the best port city probably in the whole world for sailors. There was everything in Shanghai that you had money to buy. There was all kinds of girls of every nationality. There was all kinds of booze. You could buy uh, the best beer. You got a, a, a whole quart of beer for 60 cents Mex. Mex was... Uh, was Chinese money, and we traded, uh, we got uh, $5 in Mex 
for one dollar American gold money. Our money was called gold in those days because it were gold, gold certificates. And uh, so we had a great time going to show in Sh Shanghai. And I met a lot of beautiful Russian girls and, and, and some real... Oh, I never told you that I once owned a girl, did I? I don't think so. Well, one, one, one time I'm in a rickshaw, and, and there's a bunch of uh, 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 Chinese coolie types, and they're beating up on this guy, and it looked like a, like a, 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 a white guy, American guy, to me. So I stopped my rickshaw and got out and started wiping, wiping out these uh, these coolies. And and when I started after them, they all ran. And the guy they were picking on was an American. He turned out to be an, an ex Navy sailor. But when he retired, he went back to Shanghai and he opened up a little saloon. So he was grateful. I I, I forget why they had a reason for picking on him. I forget what that reason was. But anyway, he was grateful to me. So he insisted that, that uh, I accompany him back to his saloon. And uh, so everything was on a the house there. And so every time I went ashore and I stopped there, he wouldn't take any money for me. And we got to be real good buddies. And one day, there was a, a, a pretty little girl. Uh, her name was Marilyn or something. I can't. Agree. I think I just called her Mary to be easy about it, but she was a pretty little girl. What they, what they did in those days, uh, 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 a father could sell his daughter to uh, someone, usually a saloon keeper like that, uh, for a price, and then she was uh, enslaved by this guy for a number of years. She had to work for him for, for, for nothing, I guess until she worked off the debt that her her father had been paid for her. And Mary was in that circumstance with this, with this guy. So he asked me one day, he says, he says, you're kind of sweet on that little Marilyn. He says, uh, how would you like to have her? <laughs> says, what do you mean you have her? He says, look, he says, I'll give her your papers. And so he turned her over to me with her papers and uh, of course she knew all about this, and she took me home with her that night. And uh, she couldn't speak hardly any English, but it, but I understood what she meant. That the papers were written all in in, in Chinese, and these were the were the, the, the papers that indicated that it was like writing off. You know, when you write off for a car, the the, the saloon keeper had signed her off to me, and so now she was mine. Well, when I understood this point, <laughs> this I didn't want any responsibility of a, a little Chinese girl. So she took me to a place which was like um, like a uh, public, uh, where's the guy who put the seals on things? It was like that. And so he took my signature down and gave her the papers and now she was a free person. So when I went back to the saloon keeper to find out why he had done that, he says, well, look, he says, he says, I knew you would do that. I couldn't tell you to do it. He says, I knew that you wouldn't keep that girl. He says, uh, but this the only way I could give her her freedom without getting in trouble with all the rest of the girls. So when I signed her off to you, the other girls weren't upset and she was yours. So what you do with her is your own business. If you gave her, if you turned her loose, that's fine. So at least I was a slave owner for about a week. How about um, when you made the big rescue on the Shanghai River? Oh, that was doing that was doing that uh, that fighting I was telling you about when when uh, when the, when the Japs were moving down there and the fighting was going across the river. When the, when the, when the guys got hit on our ship, we had two casualties uh, on on. Uh, on our ship, I got I got a picture. Didn't I show you a picture of him? One, one yes, of my you did. stories. Yes, the guy did. got shot through the hip. A big, fifty caliber machine gun bullet went right through there. Took his whole hip off. And uh, so, uh, 
anyway, uh, these these sampans were trying to get out of uh, uh, Putung, and they were loading them on there just as heavy as they could get, and then they would uh, they, they used a sculling horse, you know, to, and they and they would run them across the street to get into into Main Shanghai. And, and 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 everybody that could pay to get on one of these uh, uh, sampans was was fleeing from Putung to Shanghai. Well, in the process, uh, two of them got overturned. I think they were overloaded in the wake of one of those uh, those uh, Japanese patrol boats uh, caused them to overturn. And there was a bunch of women and children floating in the water. So I hollered at my uh, boat crew and I says. Uh, Come on, we got to get out there. So without anybody's permission, I manned my boat, took off out there, and uh, and started pulling these people out of the water. And some of them were pregnant women, and uh, so I we, we finally got about six of them. But now we were, we were running right down into the fire where where the main battle was going on, and uh, so I had to get out of there. And so I took the six. Chinese women that uh, we pulled out of the river and started up the river to the where the river police where the the British river police had a station right on the right on the docks of the river. So instead of going back to my own ship, I took them right up there. Well, when I, when I got up there, they didn't want them. It seems that there's a custom in China when you rescue somebody, you're responsible for them. In other words, they become your responsibility. Like when you gave me uh, my dog Candy, Candy became my responsibility for the rest of her life. So all of a sudden, I'm responsible for these Chinese people for the rest of her life. So boy, I can't hack that. So I left the boat and I ran up to the river police and I told them that what, what had happened and I finally got uh, some officer that sent uh, a crew down to pick these uh, people up off the boat. Well, it was, uh, I, I got, got rid of the, the, the Chinese ladies, and uh, uh, one of them was ob obviously pregnant, just about to have her baby. And I got rid of them, so I got back in her boat, and we, we, we went back to the ship. Well, boy, when I got back to the ship, the old man got me up into his room, and he led into me, and he's going to give me a general cart marshal for leaving my ship and taking my crew and boat without anybody's permission. I got no permission to take that boat away by myself. I have to have orders to take that boat away from from the ship. I don't never take the motor launch away on my own. So he threatened me with the general court martial, which is really serious stuff. But what happened? There was a, a reporter in the police station at the time that these refugees came in there. So he got the story in the, about the Finch had rescued these people. So that night in the, in, the, in the English newspapers was the big headline, USS Finch rescues uh, uh, refugees from Putung uh, and the Wangpu River. And the uh, captain got all the credit for it. They had the captain's name as he was the one that was the, the hero. So when he read that, he decided that it wasn't exactly the right thing to do to get me a court martial <laughs> when I had made him a hero, so he never said another word about it again. Except him and I were really on on a bad uh, degree from then, then on. And so anyway, that's a story about the uh, the rescue. And it wasn't. I did have those papers at one time, but I lost them. In the years going by, I guess I lost him because it it bragged about the captain being the, the hero, not me.